Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Welcome to Authentic Conversations presented by Transition Clarity. I'm your host, Adele Bernard, and today it's my delight pleasure to bring on Amy Blakesley of Calm Ocean Coaching. And as we get started, I'm going to ask her to share a little bit about you, how you got into coaching, what brought you into coaching, and, you know, the synopsis, so we can go from there. So welcome. Great. Thank you so much. I'm really um, honored and happy to be here today. Um, well, as far as getting into coaching, I had actually had a long career in technology. So um, in the corporate world, and uh, which I'm very um, blessed to have had that career, but it did not really um, satisfy, you know, it didn't leave me feeling fully fulfilled in my life. I felt like there was something greater for me to do in my life. And I had felt that throughout my, you know, entire career and my whole life. And as I was on the journey to discover what is really my purpose, it became very clear that my purpose is to help other people who are on the same journey that I was on. So, um, you know, I used uh, the modality life energy coaching that I used to just greatly change my life around. And I just felt very called that you know, this is uh, where I need to be in my life and to bring what I call our soul mission to life um, through it. Okay, I want to I want to touch on that, um, you know, that calling to be doing something different because we as we know, we're both from the corporate world and there's nothing wrong with the corporate world. We knew we all need the corporate world in some form or fashion. I too was in the corporate world going, there's got to be something better. There's got to be something bigger. And it started that internal, um, as a lack of a better word, the spiritual journey. Mm-hmm. How did that spiritual journey start opening up for you, for you to say, this corporate world just maybe isn't fitting for me anymore. So where is spirit leading me? Where, you know? Right. Yeah, my spiritual journey um, happened a little bit differently for me. Um, I had a very challenging childhood with a lot of trauma, and I was on my own at a very young age when I was 17. And I, because I didn't have anyone to support me, I had to make decisions about my life, right? And at first I started around, um, kind of bouncing around, I call it the school of hard knocks, right? And, um, you know, I had been an honor student when I was in school, but I'm out doing jobs like waitressing and stuff like that, right? So I'm not living to my full potential at all. And somebody told me, like, you need to go into computers. And so that's how um, there was a very easy bachelor's of science degree program. Um, not easy in that the content was easy, but the format was really easy for me to be able to do. So um, I went into computer technology um, really more from a survival perspective, right? And luckily I was very good at it. I had never written a single line of code before um, I, I made this big investment. Luckily, um, I'm very analytical too, too so I was able um, to do that. But when I look back at my whole life, my um, when I was a child, I always, very small child, I always wanted to show everybody how you know magnificent they were even my little friends or whatever when they were upset i wanted to do everything i could to let them see that you know, they're more than just this you know hurt or you know um what somebody else said to them or whatever and then as i got a little older i wanted to become a teenager and then later i wanted to become um, a psychiatrist which i think is common when people are going through a lot of challenges in their life they look to things like that um, so I'm in the corporate world and in technology and very good jobs. I've worked for some very great companies and with some very talented people, mm -hmm. but I also had this underlying anxiety that was um, really starting to rear its ugly head and get very intense. And the anxiety was really caused from unresolved childhood trauma, but um, I also see it as a way my soul was using it to wake me up, like this is who you're supposed to, you're not supposed to be this, you know, you're out of alignment with who you are. So mm -hmm. that is when I was, I say, when you suffer, you seek. And I started my seeking and that is how um, 
I became awakened by the book, The Secret, actually, <laughs> was the, the first book. Um, and it's funny because when I saw the, um, it was in the Time magazine and there was a review for it. It wasn't even a good review, but it was like, I was like, I have to get this book now. I have to go mm-hmm. get it. And that set me off on a path of working with, you know, master spiritual teachers and coaches and just hundreds of books, anything I could get my hands on to really understand, you know, what was the anxiety? Who was I? Why was I here? And um, so that's how I uh, came to my spiritual awakening. And of course, once you spiritually awaken, the corporate world can become a very challenge, challenging place to be in. Um, mm-hmm. So um, that is part of the reason why I work with people who are in the corporate world now is because I really feel that every person that we can um, transition them out of that fear-based ego mode into a love or heart-based mode. Even just one person, one leader at the top has the potential to really shift that entire um, organization. So um, I do, you know, I, I think the corporate world is obviously it's a good place. It brings a lot, you know, a lot to people and, you know, salaries, food, and, you know, you can bring your stuff. It's just, it it needs to shift from, from fear to love. So. Well, and that brings up a good point of um, the spiritual leaders who we listen to and follow. And, and I think Matt Kahn says it the best, everything is happening for you, not to you. Yeah. And, and you think about like, you know, especially for women wearing pearls, that pearl has to have a lot of grit before it becomes a pearl Mm -hmm. or the diamond in the rough. Right. And so just because it might seem hard or just, or difficult, or this doesn't make sense, doesn't mean you're not becoming the diamond that you are meant to be to shine your light in the world. And I and I just want to kind of make a little joke because as we were talking before, you said, you know, but you have that analytical side. You have that, right? And I'm like, yeah, you went for psychiatrist. I went for psychologist in the corporate. Because <laughs> I'm like, sure, come back to me. I, I'll, I'll feel your feelings. I'll help you through it. Yeah. I didn't want to do the technical side. Right. <laughs> right. Well, That's so funny because, you know, the work that I do in energy work, it's really all about raising your consciousness. So finding all of the beliefs and, you know, energy within you that is negative and limiting and not aligned to your true authentic self and transforming them to love and raising it. Well, consciousness is so complex, right? And I love that about it. And it, it allows me to use my analytical mind. And I've had people who have remarked to me about my transition saying, well, I can't believe you went from like, you know, doing these big data and analytical systems to, um, to this energy work. And I'm like, well, it's this, it's, we're programming. It's the same metrics. <laughs> one's programming systems and the other one's kind of deprogramming your, your mind or your being, right. To, yeah. to expose who you really are. So um, I just, I find it a really fascinating talk topic as well. Well, and it's interesting how when people are saying, well, they don't understand it. And it's like, because they haven't awoken to being in the matrix. Yes. Right. The matrix wasn't just a movie. <laughs> <laughs> right. Actually, and, well, and, and it was funny because I, I wish I could remember, but someone said recently that, you know, like, well, what's Marvel doing? What's it like? I don't get it. And they literally said, Marvel's doing what they're supposed to be doing to wake up the matrix. And I was like, mm-hmm. that was on normal, that was on normal broadcast. Like, okay. Cause I don't get the movies. I will never go see them. I'm like, I don't get it. But right. I also know I've been awake for a long time. So I don't need to get it. Right. I'm, I'm past the Marvel movies, but I appreciate them for what they're trying to do for humanity. Mm-hmm. And I don't care how you wake up. I'm saying the time is to wake up. Right. The time mm-hmm. is to start questioning what you've been told. Is this my truth or is it just a tape in our head? Right. You know? Yeah. And that's why I always say um, one way that I pose it to people is like, you can rewrite your story. You can rewrite it. I say rewrite your success story. Um, and 
people do have to realize all of these things that they're thinking about themselves. Um, you know, they're, they're likely things that either their parents said to them or society, like we know how society and the media and all of that is huge around programming people's minds, right? Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. also what goes into it when you're a child, especially, you know, ages zero to seven, your mind is a sponge and you may draw your own conclusions about things that probably had no meaning but when you're a child you're like oh my it's like they said that thing to me and it really crushed me and now that goes into your, your subconscious and starts creating um you know relations and connections with things that just perpetuate throughout your life until you go back and address that and so we do also carry within us our ancestral history so not only are we all dealing with what's happening in the modern world today but we do have these underlying beliefs especially women a lot of beliefs around gender roles um mm -hmm. that don't apply today and, um, you know, there's old religious beliefs from our ancestors that are still in us where we're making some associations, like whether how we're, you know, even dealing with authority figures in work or government or whatever. So um, there's a lot there <laughs> to unpack. Well, and, and that's very um, telling, especially in the work I do is like, I will go through the generational lines, right? Mm -hmm. And and like you know especially if if they're in a meditative state and it's like so when they're having like say a flashback or whatever seeing a different timeline it's like well, where is this timeline mm -hmm. and it's like well i'm a man but in this life they're a woman and it's like okay so what's the man doing and who are they interacting with and then all of a sudden they go oh my gosh i understand why i'm having troubles with my teenager yeah because the roles are reversed mm-hmm Right. And, and it's, um, and I'm finding even with my own self, it's like, you know, you wake up and you're just kind of going, okay, body come back because you're just like, that was, is it a dream? Is it a realignment of different lifetimes to help me go forward in this lifetime? Is it, what is it? I don't know. I'll just lay in bed till I fully come back. <laughs> right? right. Because, and that's the biggest thing is like, well, people say, well, I don't dream. And it's like, we all dream it's just a matter of remembering but we also have to remember that's when our soul is doing its work right for us to be in this body it goes off and does whatever it has to do so we can have more um, information and understanding so we can move forward in this life exactly yeah and I do believe that we do some traveling I had a period of a couple of years where I would have dreams and end up in certain scenarios, not the same. Sometimes they were, they felt the same, but I remember being there with beings, not always human, but just being there with beings and they were all very familiar. I'm like, oh, it's you again, you know, yeah. just kind of interesting. And it's, I haven't thought about that in a couple of years. I obviously haven't had those dreams in a while, <laughs> but. Well, and and for me, um, my dreams are more feelings because I, I tend to be more on the empathic of feeling and if I need more information, I'll say, okay, that dream didn't make sense, but this is how I felt. Can you please show me? Yeah, that's interesting. Right? And then I'll get different, you know, scenarios, whatever. And and it's really interesting because all the spiritual teachers are talking about being in that flow, having that energy or the, the vibration at the higher vibration so you can attract what you're truly wanting. And we hear it, we hear it, we hear it. And then Yesterday, I think I actually fully um, embraced it because I was supposed to have a call. I canceled. Fine. I ended up having my, usually my Sunday mornings are insane. <laughs> um, it was a calm, quiet one. So then I go and volunteer with the equine program. And I ended up with the hard kit, the first class. And we giggled and laughed. And it was like, oh, this is amazing. The horse was amazing. We're all having a good time. Then we come to the next, second class. And that student had spoke up the, at the end of the week last week. And then we're trying all these new things. And all of a sudden, she's just like, that was the best Thanksgiving present ever. And I said, why? And she goes, because I got to do it on my own. And I said, because you spoke up. Mm -hmm. You actually followed what we were asking you to do to relax into your body to relax into how the horse was moving right and I said 
you learned it really fast. Right. And look at the progress that you got to make. And and so I when I came home, I just felt so relaxed and at peace. And I'm like, this is what everyone keeps on talking about, including myself. Right. So hard for us to understand it on our own. Right. Yeah, I've I've come to look at it a little differently myself recently. Um, like you had mentioned, life is happening for us. I feel like mm-hmm. life happens through us. So it's really yeah. What is happening, you know, based on our level of consciousness and, Mm -hmm. um, you know, we are the, um, we're the studio, the screenplay writer, the director, producer, actors, and audience of our life. Right. And, um, I used to be very much about, okay, I'm going to manifest or attract. And I found that to be at times, it was very frustrating for me because I would be putting my affirmations out there or whatever. And Mm -hmm. Like, it feels like it's a very force doing thing. Like I have to do something to attract, yeah. I have to do something, but I've come to believe like everything that you put out there, it exists already. It's just not in this dimension. So I've changed it to be like, okay, I'm going to materialize that. Now it's going to materialize in the physical world for me. And it's taken a lot of resistance off of it for me. And I've had, um, you know, I'll even do little quick things like, okay, even just walking my dog who likes to pull one way all the time. Like she doesn't want to come down to go in and and I'll be like, okay, I'm putting it out there to my spiritual support team. And I just say, Hey, let have her turn. She's going to turn down and walk down this thing very quickly. And I release it. And she did, (laughs) you know? So even just simple things like that, um, you know, because of course, when we want to go for the bigger things, that's where all of our um, beliefs and, you know, limiting beliefs start flying in our face. Um, you know, and we're saying, oh, that the affirmation doesn't work. You know, like if I say mm-hmm. oh, I'm, I'm attracting five clients this week, well, all of the beliefs that don't align to that are going to come up and show themselves. They're going to rear their ugly heads and people are going to say, well, that means affirmations don't work. But what it's doing is working perfectly and it's showing yeah. you exactly where you're in or out of alignment. So once you have that, it's really good feedback. You have that, then you can say, okay, let's dig into um, where these limiting beliefs are coming from and change that energy behind them. So well, and I think I'll take a, a in a different tangent just because why not? We all learn from each other. And is with the affirmation and or the intention or whatever word you want to use, right? It's one thing. And I'm saying is my vibration or my beingness at the level to attract the new clients that are trying to find me. Right. If I'm not, they're not finding me. Right. And and um, like we've talked about this about, you know, like are we chasing people to be coming into our network or are we allowing them to come? Mm-hmm. And I used to chase. I'd be the first person to say like, well, I could help them and they could do it. And it's like, like they never asked. And I was like, dang, that was a spiritual whack, right? <laughs> and now... Um, I just, hey, I'm here. If you want to connect, great. If you don't, all good. We're not, you're not part of my tribe. And it's been so rewarding that way because yeah. like I met you and I'm like, this is a great relationship. And I yeah. look forward to seeing it grow, right? Because I wasn't going, nah, 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 nah. and you're like, stop, stop it. I'm like, but I, I want to help. I want to work with you. I want to. And yeah, stop it. Right. I become that annoying pest that we don't like. Instead yeah. of going, if it feels right to you, connect. If it doesn't, move on. Right. Yeah. And I think we have to look at our clients that way too, right? Because exactly. Um, as a coach, you know, we can't attract what we haven't gone through. Right. So if we're not willing to stretch ourselves for that higher level or that different vibration, I shouldn't say higher because it's just a different vibration of beingness, those five new clients can't vibrate to you. 
Right. Well, it's interesting about that in the work that I do, which is uh, life energy coaching, which is a very specific modality. It uses a very specific field of very high frequency, 12 dimensional supported by archangels and all of that. And when, whether I have someone doing a program that I've created or um, right before we meet, I actually go through a transition in my energy so that I'm prepared to hold the space for them at everything that had not already, you know, that I haven't already addressed. So it helps to me make the, make, you know, the, the space more safe and loving for them when we're meeting, mm -hmm. actually the ener energy transformation is easier for them. Um, and it also broadens my field then that I have, um, mm -hmm. to support people with. So I keep expanding, as well through them um so but it is interesting when it first started happening to me when I first started doing this I'm like oh my god why am I having all of this like crazy anxiety <laughs> energy where is it coming from and then you're like oh okay no okay, no, yeah, I know. <laughs> so, well it's funny because um I I used to question why I find recovering addicts I'm like I don't get it and then one actually enlightened me. He goes, I don't understand how you don't get it. And I go, explain it. He goes, because you are being, you are showing us that we can always be the light. And I'm like, oh, he goes, you have that connection. You're right. not searching for it. You're being connected to source, God, whatever you want to say. Right. Mm -hmm. And being the light. He goes, so we coming out of addiction go oh this is what we're trying to get through every day choosing to say yes to stay sober or whatever right and i'm like cool but i never understood it years i've been trying to figure out why addicts love me right <laughs> in recovery right not so much not in recovery but once they're in recovery they they flock to me and i'm like this is funny yeah that's great. They were reading. I do. Um, your point is, um, I do attract people who are pretty much in the same spots that I've been in. Um, so mm -hmm. it's absolutely true. And of course, they give me the most joy to work with because I can put myself in yeah. their shoes and I can see their transformations. Um, so yeah, it's, it's a blessing. I mean, when you can look back at your life experience and realize that things happen the way they did, like, so with my book that I wrote, um, mm -hmm. uh, my book, yeah, Awakening, share your book. <laughs> yeah. Awakening through anxiety, a journey to finding okay. one's self. So this is really my journey of awakening. And I do share my, um, personal story in it, my childhood and all of the tribulations and all of that. Um, but I also share things that helped me to um, get rid of the anxiety, uh, transform the anxiety, I should say, I shouldn't say get rid of it. You know, one thing that I came to really feel is that, and, and I hated it, I hated my anxiety, I cursed that all the time, because, you know, it was producing some pretty bad symptoms in me, like I couldn't sign my name in front of people, I was afraid, you know, and I would shake because of that. Um, all these things, but I now I see my anxiety if I get it, um, which I don't get anxiety near, you know, maybe 5% of what I used to get. Um, and that's for new situations. But now I see it as just a partner. It's my body very perfectly showing up because our body is our subconscious mind. My body mm -hmm. is perfectly showing me up where I am out of alignment with my authentic self and mm -hmm. Um, who I came here to be. So I, um, it, I do see it as a blessing. And when I wrote the book, one of the publishers that I initially worked with, I ended up self publishing it. But you know, when we put first put the first draft out there, and he read it, he was like, How do you feel like seeing this all out there? And, you know, I'm like, I just feel like I lived it so I could tell it. And so if I change even one person's life with this story, it will have been worth it. And thankfully, um, many people have told me that I've helped to either resolve things in their childhood. One woman who didn't realize that she was an empath and that mm. 
a lot of the stuff that was showing up in my body that I thought was mine wasn't mine either. Um, so I talk about that in the book. Um, and she said, reading that, she realized she was an empath. She had no idea. And she was able to bring it under control. And for the first time ever in her marriage, her and her husband and the kids went away for a weekend. She said that was the first time I ever was in the moment after, you know, after I realized this, I did some of your exercises about being present and all of that. So, um, yeah, just, you know, that stuff like that makes my heart sing too. Well, um, and it's, and it's really important. So I'll take it a step further. So anxiety is being too much in the future. Depression is too much in the past. Yeah. So if either one is happening that is your body saying hello check in with me because you're not here you're not present and it comes back to the presence within you the yeah. beingness of you because those things can't happen if you're present because in the presence you are in the flow you're in that unconditional love right I will say that there is a time though being present even um, because of being somebody who picks up on energy of mm -hmm. everything mm -hmm. and everyone. Um, I thought I was having anxiety a lot of times, when, but I was really picking up other people's energy. So yeah. <laughs> you can still have all of those feelings in your body, but until you're aware to know what's really mine, um, yeah. what's, what's not. And, well, you know, and that's what I, that's, what I agree with what you're saying is because it's like, okay, so if the anxiety is coming, the first thing I say is stop. Yeah. Where am I? Is this mine? Do mm -hmm. I have to do with anything with it? Move it on up. Yeah. If it's mine, I stop, I deal with it, I handle it at that moment. If it's not, move it on out and my, my body will go, it's not yours. Yeah. But it's, it's coming into presence that is like, poof. Like I, like if I'm out walking or whatever, and like I'm going, I go stop, and I literally stop walking. I shut my eyes. I take a couple of breaths, and I go, "Is this mine? No, it's someone else's tape that has gotten caught into my head." Thank you for sharing. I want to be within myself. Mm -hmm. Okay, and it goes, and then I'm back in my body. I'm present. Right. Yep. Yeah. I mean, it could be a car driving by. I'll be like, oh, come on, stop leaving your garbage with me. But, <laughs> but on in saying that, I'm the one that's wrong because I'm picking it up. Right. They never asked for me to pick it up. <laughs> well, I would say on an energy level, it does happen. There are, oh, um, yeah. there are that they are specifically, there is a, that's a lot of the manip manipulation that's happening too through our media and mind control is very specifically manipulating people's energy so that there, you know, a lot of things feed off of the fear, you know, mm -hmm. at, and we're talking energetic source. We're not talking like, mm -hmm. in the, and I wasn't going down that rabbit hole. Yeah. I was just saying like a that's car a just hole. driving by, right? <laughs> like a car driving by and all of a sudden I'm like, I yeah. feel wonky. Right. They could have been having a conversation. They could have they could have had the news on in the car. That has nothing to do with me. Right. They never asked me to pick it up, but my energetics picked it up. And I'm like, what are you doing? It's not yeah. yours to have. Move yeah. it on out. Thank you for sharing. And so I'm saying, I'm saying to people who are listening, we're not saying this is like every day, all day long, but sometimes just take a breath, take a step back and say, is this me? If it's not, let it go. Yeah. Right. And then you think about like, you know, you think of that song, let it go. And it's like, it might be in a kid's show, but we all need to learn it. Right. The, um, the other thing that I talk about in my book that really helps me too, is, uh, you know, you talk about getting present and it's so important. Right. Um, and it's funny when I was in the corporate world and I, really had my presence down and, you know, I'd be in meetings and stuff and I'd have so many people be like, wow, you know, and if I couldn't show up to like a meeting that was going to be highly political, there are people be like, like, can you please be there? We need, we need your presence in this meeting. It's so calm because everybody else, you know, when the egos start flying, that's, you know, everybody goes into fear mode. Um, so, but in my um, book, one of the things getting present is being in your heart space. So really just keeping your attention on your heart, which is, you know, your most intelligent 
source mm-hmm. of information. For your, heart song. Hmm? For your heart song. Yes. And, um, you know, that's when, you know, I can, you know, very quickly, even you can just connect and just start feeling that joy and that energy coming out, um, radiating from it and, you know, opening yourself up then to guidance from your, you know, inner self and higher self and such. So Mm -hmm. huge. And of course, when you're in your heart space, as I would be in a lot of meetings in the corporate world, sitting in my heart space, that energy is going out to people too. And people are not accustomed to that, right? Because most people's awareness is just somewhere outside their forehead. Um, You know, the mind, because they, they're not practicing presence or, um, or this, but it it can completely change the dynamics of um, a room and where you're at. Well, it's funny because I had a boss at one time. He he was a commander, like like the architect commander, right? And he'd be going to these big meetings with all the VPs and the big board, and and he'd wear a red shirt. And I'm like, "You're joking, right?" He goes, "What?" And I go, "Whatever." And I he'd go off to the meeting. He'd come back and he'd just be raging, and I go can you do us all a favor? And he goes, what? And I go, can you bring some other colored shirts in to change if you forget, if you have that meeting? What are you talking about? Is it like a light blue or white? Or white? He thinks I'm off my rocker. And I'm like, whatever. And then I go, you have that meeting? And he goes, I'll change. I go, thank you. And he comes back from the meeting and goes, I don't know what the heck you do, but that was weird. I go, you're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> or we're in a meeting and and it's getting too crazy and I'm like oh I can't do this and I literally cover my belly button because then it takes my energy out of the room mm. they can keep going and like you said you send send the love because you've closed off to your door to collecting anything right yeah right and and it's just yeah like it changes how you can handle me. And I, I mean, this could be even like you have to go to a function. There's lots of different energies in the room, right? Mm-hmm. Give your belly button. Put a piece of tape over your belly button. It mm-hmm. can't affect you. Yeah. You can still share the love. Their stuff can't come back. That's interesting. I have not heard that about the belly button before. So... Can you just share a little bit more about the belly button and why? That sure. Is? Well, think about the belly button as how you came into life. Mm-hmm. All your nutrients, all your emotions, everything comes through the belly button through your mom. Okay. So whatever she's going through, you're getting. Mm-hmm. Right. That's why there can be womb trauma. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right. And so when you're when you're out in public or you have to like. And the person who taught me, was, um, she used to say, like, she had to go to bar functions. I go, what do you mean? She goes, well, for what my job. And I'm like, okay. And she's an energy worker, so I gig too, right? Like all of us. And she'd, she'd put a rock in her belly button, depending on what she needed, she felt she needed to enter into this room. So sometimes she'd use tiger's eye or, you know, like obsidian or whatever, right? And I'm like, interesting. But I was still young then. I didn't realize, right? I'm like, yeah, I'm in my 20s, whatever. And then I'm like, I did it one day, going to the bar. And I'm like, this is a game changer. Because I actually could go and have fun without picking up all the energies. Right. Right? Because my friends who had drank and smoke and whatever, I've gone, how come you have the hangover? And I go, I don't know. But this sucks. Like, I would be out for like two days. Because I was having that empathic hangover. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right? I might not have been drinking the alcohol, but I would I would take it in through my pores. Once I put the rocker, I covered my belly button. That was fine. Hmm. That's really that's really interesting. I yeah. just I put a light around me. I have Archangel Michael protect me through it, and that helps me. But prior to that, um, I mean I've been places, especially like I went to a Bruce Springsteen concert once. And we're fine. And just all of a sudden, I was so overcome with the energy. This was before I had this practice in there. But, you know, when 
when that happens to you and you're with people who don't understand that you're actually feeling everyone in you, it's, um, it can be pretty, it can be pretty challenging with the other people. Well, and it's funny because like I used to, I used to use the golden egg, right? Before I knew about archangels and all that, right? I just covered myself with the golden egg that no one can penetrate. And sometimes it would penetrate and I'm like, hmm. Nothing has ever penetrated the rock. Oh, huh, that's interesting. And and it's funny because like my nephew now is really into the concerts or whatever. He sends me clips and I'm like, oh, cool. And even sometimes the clips are too much because I can pick up the energy of the, the stadium. Yeah. So I know concerts are out of my, they're not my future. Yeah. Or unless I can really say, okay, Michael, we really got to work together. <laughs> like, right. So for sure. <laughs> yeah so the clients that are coming to you right now what is the theme what's the theme mm -hmm. um typically uh i'm in the corporate world and i am not feeling fulfilled in the work i'm doing i have a lot of mm -hmm. anxiety and stress uh a lot have challenges with leadership above them um so it's really you know they're really getting reflections back of their uh, alignment to love through the corporate world. So um, it's helping to, you know, um, get that uh, alignment. I'm, I really, my dog, she must, she loves what we're talking about because she came over here always like it. wanting my attention. She's very, she's a very, um, very in tuned energy dog. Actually, she probably could have been an emotional support dog. Um, but she just likes to come over. I always know we're in like a really good topic when she comes over. <laughs> um, yeah. So really helping them to get clarity. Um, so that some people it's just getting clear career clarity. Some people it's just helping them through. I'm really dealing with this issue here. Mm -hmm. and I really need help on it. And then others, it's taking them all the way through to, um, discover and align to you know embodying their purpose which their their real purpose that you can you know I call it your soul mission but the, you can only get to really knowing what that purpose is is when you've stripped away all of those beliefs that society gave to you um you know your parents all the things we talked about earlier plus your beliefs around money Mm -hmm. um, establish, establishing that connection to your higher self and what I like to call your spiritual support team. So any of the archangels, ascended masters and such. So you can get really the clear guidance on why you're really supposed to be here because nobody else can tell you that. Right. And I know you people could be walking around thinking, well, so-and-so told me I was really good at this as a child. So that should be my life purpose. And maybe that's not, and maybe it is, but um it's something you have to discover on your well, own well and it's funny because I was told to be a nurse a teacher a healer and I'm like yep I'm all of those as I'm my lighthouse yeah I'm here to be the light <laughs> exactly a light worker and, and that's I mean that's a good clarification too of it doesn't need to be a profession that's true I agree right um, because yeah like I mean young when I was younger all I went to be was a mom and a wife Mm -hmm. And then I was like, I have to get a career. What the hell is that? <laughs> and then I didn't like that either. But I always, from three years old through to today, I've been the lighthouse. Right. Well, and the whole, it would be great if we, our society, actually, we had probably more moms or, you know, at home with their children being the light for their children. I think that it. Or dads. Dads. Yeah. That's what I'm, yeah. Moms, parents. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, um, but it is, since you brought up light, like my clients are light workers who probably don't even know that that's why they're here yet. or just waking up to that. Um, that there's that lots of secret ones in corporate, but we need them there. You have to be, I actually have a post going out tomorrow on LinkedIn asking people, are you a light worker making waves in the corporate world? <laughs> Cause I want to I'm just curious to see, um, i you know, and will you say we'll that? Have to answer that? Yeah, answer it. That would be great. Yeah. Because there are. And unfortunately, until you know how that you are, you understand the things we were just talking about with light and everything, 
the corporate world can be a brutal place because you're in with so many different people, so many situations and stuff are just activating personalities. Yeah. And it's activating all this stuff within you that is really, I think is a positive thing if you're on an expansion and wanting, you know, all of that with your consciousness. But if you're, if you're not aware of it yet, it can be debilitating at times, right? Mm -hmm. In some of the cases or, and especially when you're in like very highly competitive, um, you know, cutthroat environments, which I have worked in some of those in like startups and um, in the entertainment industry can be very um, cutthroat, cutthroat. So very, you know, not, you know, not as aligned, more about who, you know, things like that than being aligned to merit and purpose and all of that. So, and not all of it, I'm not making a blanket statement. I, there no, were no, I, get, I hear what you're saying. And it's interesting because I've been I've been getting more people of what's this all for, mm -hmm. right? Especially especially in the last few years, and then it's like, well, yeah, I need I need to generate some money, but I don't believe it's in my job anymore. Mm -hmm. Where else can I? Where else can I generate some money? Um, and just wanting more fulfillment yeah. than a paycheck yeah right. and that's um the data person in me gallup does their state of the global workplace report um you know every year i don't know when they started it but um this year globally i think it's this year 77 percent of workers are disengaged at work and mm -hmm. that can be based on um, culture, leadership, um, their well-being, and um, salary, even to a certain extent. But they were saying, I think it was fifty-one percent of workers worldwide were actively looking or planning on act starting a search for a new job because you know they're looking for the answer outside of themselves. Um, mm -hmm. When these answers are, I think, are well, and and that's a good point to say because you can change the job, but it's still you going to that job. Yeah, wherever so the can, same wherever issues, you you're going to find the same people mirroring back to you until you look in the mirror and say, I can change this. I need to change this. Yeah. Right. And, and that's what I like. So so when I originally started in my company, I worked with homes. Mm -hmm. Right. Clearing the energy of the home. So when they came home from the stressful work day, they had their sanctuary. Right, because I I even realized in my own life it wasn't it wasn't important to go for a massage outside of my home or for counseling outside of my home if I came home to the same crap because mm -hmm. all that release came back tenfold as soon as I walked into the crap. Mm -hmm. Right, so if you clear the crap from the house, then you can go and get it all released, however you need to release it. And then you come home and you're in your sanctuary and you're good. Right. So it's no use leaving the job thinking it's the job. Right. Well, and that's what it's we the do. the crops within you. <laughs> yeah. And I was in that pattern too before I woke up and realized that. And, you know, I've talked to other people too. And if you say to people who are not awake yet, like family and stuff like that, and you're like, well, you know, you can actually it's just showing you where your energy is out of alignment with love and you can, and, you know, shift, transform that back to love. And you're going to change what's in your experience. They actually, cause they're coming from ego. Still, they get very um, defensive, right? I didn't ask for this. I'm not being like that. They're being like that. Um, but once you experience it, you can start to feel how empowering it is to know that you have that control within yourself, right? Mm -hmm. That you don't have to rely on what's happening um, with other people and all of that, but you can change who you are, like the saying, be the change you want to see in the world, embody it. And you, what's going to show up in your external experience is going to match mm -hmm. that, which you are. So, yeah. Yeah. It's Pretty yeah. powerful no, stuff. It's, yeah, well, and and I just going back to the horses for a second. It's like, um, like the one little guy. Like when his mom brought him, it was kind of chaotic. So much so he fell off the horse. We've never in a year we've never had anyone fall off a horse. His dad brings him. Totally different kid. 
giggles, has fun. Like he he's not he's not communicative, right? Like he, right? And so I'm like, interesting. Yeah, yeah, and and you yeah. know, and so, and it's even even like when um, I see these parents like when their kid wipes out or whatever, and they instantly hug, and I'm like, you're anchoring, you're mm -hmm. anchoring the pain. Yeah. Right. Kind of hold on the side. Anything bleeding? Any boo boos? Do you need a kiss on the forehead? And once they start breathing again and realize they're okay, and you know, mom or dad are here to support them, it's all good. Then you can ring in for the love. Right. But before that, you're going to end up with needy, needy adults. Yeah. Yeah, you got to learn how to let energy move through you, right? So it doesn't get mm -hmm. stuck within your within your body, right? Because that's going to create um, what's showing up in your, you know, not and also create illness within your body as well. Yeah. So I don't know if you read the Indigo Children book. I did not years and years ago, um, and I remember reading it. Gone. Well, yeah, they're just waking up to who we are. <laughs> because basically the book is saying like the indigos are the ones like this is before empath was is was the word right and and they'd be saying like if a kid got hit in the playground or hurt in the playground the indigo circle and i was like yeah because we're the ones that can feel their pain to help them right <laughs> yeah so i was just laughing <laughs> Yeah, that's, that's really interesting. Hmm. Yeah, someone told me to read the book. I never did. My children, I think, are in that age range. They're in their late teens now from the Indigo children. Oh, era. the the teens could be crystals. I'm an Indigo. Oh, I see. Okay. So the Indigos have been slowly filing in um, 50s, 60s, 70s. Okay. Okay. And then the stars and the and the crystals, I don't know what age group, but um yeah, and it depends on the parent or the grandparents mm. to what the kids can come in because if the parents or the grandparents are awakened, then they can come in. Mm. Right? So I have a girlfriend who is 95 and she's awakened and her kids are awakened and her grandchildren are off the charts awakened mm -hmm. but they're also highly autistic yeah some of them right so it's it's interesting to see the three dynamics mm -hmm. all in one family and how they support each other and work through each other and um yeah yeah, I see it with my daughters. My youngest daughter is especially, she's very tuned in. And, um, you know, I I can have some pretty good conversations with her. And my oldest daughter is as well, but she's not as talkative about it. So it's something that she keeps within herself. Um, so well, maybe just, she's trying to figure it out on her own. Yeah. To figure out the feelings that are going on and um yeah because my grandniece she's so cute I'm not saying that because I'm biased because she comes up with the weirdest <laughs> like the other day I'm pickling her and she's like auntie no I said no and she goes it hurts the baby I said what do you mean it hurts the baby I said where's the baby and she goes in my tummy mm. I said you have a baby in your tummy and she goes yeah and by this time, I'm looking at her mom, right? And I go, so you're going to have the baby in 22 years? And she goes, yeah, because she's three. Okay. <laughs> right? And I just laugh. And then I'm driving home, and I'm like, um, I'm like, oh, it's that timeline. We were together before. <laughs> Like, it. well you touched on um you know past lives and stuff regression mm -hmm. you know, there's dr brian weiss who wrote like mm -hmm. yeah many uh many lives many masters mm -hmm. and stuff and so i was reading those books when my oldest daughter was like two or three you know she was probably mm -hmm. around three at the time and he says in there um you know one way you can like test this out to so ask a small child who they were the last time they were big because they're still close to that right 
And so we were sitting there, you know, my youngest daughter was between me and my um, ex-husband. Uh, well, he was my then husband. And she was sitting there on the bed next to us. And I just looked at her and I was like, Ava, who were you the last time you were big? And she looked at me and she was like, oh. and she goes, she pulls the blanket up. She's like, mommy, those are my parts. That's not for you to know. And we were just like, oh my God. <laughs> It's like crazy. And she, um, she would talk a lot. She started talking a lot about how Sunina lived down the street and she knew Sunina last time when she was big, but we, we never really figured out exactly who person Sunina was probably someone when they went to the park with the nanny and stuff at the time. But so it was really interesting to see that when they're smaller and how connected they are to those, those past experiences. Well, and even, even my nephew, he was about three and um, I was picking him up from gymnastics, I don't know, whatever, whatever. And his friend's like, that's your auntie, not your mom. And he goes, it's my mom too. Hmm. Right? And I go, whatever. <laughs> and, then, and then, so she went to her mom and she's like, he's calling her, her his auntie mom. Like, that's just wrong. And, and his, her mom's like, that's between them. Yeah. Right? So we're driving home. And I said, why are you calling me mom? He goes, well, your mom too. I said, okay. And he walks into the house. And by this time, my sister's home. Walks into the house. He goes, mom. Yeah. This is auntie, auntie's mom too. If you have a problem, it's yours. And he walked away. And I went, oh, isn't that neat? Hmm. That's great. Right? Yeah. And it was funny because like later on in life, whatever, I'd be like, quit it. He's like, what's yeah. Yeah. Well, they say that, you know, you don't get away with that crap. Yeah. Hmm? Well, no, like Brian, Dr. Brian Weiss said, souls travel in groups, you know, um, lifetime over after, you know, reenacting. Well, the we have our soul family. Yeah. Right? So I could be the parent, I could be the child, I could be the aunt. I could, and, and for instance, like I was working with my counselor who at the time was very, very guided. And I said, why am I finding all these single moms? Right? Because it was pulling in my heartstrings because one, I wasn't in a relationship. Two, all I ever wanted was kids and I wasn't getting either. And didn't get either, right? And she says, because every one of those kids has to have you in their life for whatever reason. Mm. I go, okay. And then I became fine with it. Right. And like to this day, I get the single moms or the moms like for whatever reason, the kid needs me somewhere in their life. Maybe not that close, but just, you know, like they might have been distant in a different life and they're and we're still kind of distant. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, like, oh, kids are just um, and it's funny because like I love how like how you tried that with your daughter how mm -hmm. genuine it is like you're like oh let's see what the book is really saying like see if it's true or not and and then it would be like I wouldn't have let that one go mm -hmm. right I would have been like because bedtime is when they usually talk the most mm -hmm. right especially with boys and I'd be like as you're talking to the man like so what do you have to tell me well nothing I'm like okay we'll just cuddle okay and then all of a sudden things just spill right so you could say what do you mean those parts aren't for me yeah where are you what's going on right right and this is your oldest yeah she's she'll yeah. be 20 soon so well no but just to say that so young yeah oh yeah because with my with my grandniece like the flashback was she was pregnant Mm -hmm. and I was the older the older as she was pregnant as an adult not a three-year-old yeah right and so yeah. I was like oh interesting and then I'm like do I have to know anything about this no okay carry on yeah and there's the story of that boy who was um I think Lou Gehrig and um, I forget the name of the book that was a really um very interesting story about he just came into this when at a very young age, started just sharing all this information about the teams, you know, the manager and all of that, you know. 
So and he, mm-hmm. he gets publicity through it too. <laughs> um, you know, they they like met, uh, I can't remember the name of the, Tommy Lasorda maybe of the the Dodgers and stuff like that. Okay. I really just it's a really fun story I just can't remember the name of it now but um just all of the the you know the the stuff that he knew that just yeah. couldn't have known and you know and of course as he got older I think the memories started you know getting weaker um but it was pretty cool very cool. Well, it's just like, the, I don't know if you heard about the little American kid that um, they had an accident in Italy and the parents decided to give up the organs. Oh. Right? And and uh, time, I think 60 minutes, whatever, had filmed it. And then over time, the parents decided they wanted to meet as many people that their son had donated to. And they met everyone. And this one guy who got his heart said, did your son love pistachio ice cream? And they started laughing. He goes, you know, it's really hard to find, right? And he goes, yeah, but that's why we go to Italy. Oh, he could not get enough pistachio ice cream. And then someone else with their eyes, like he was such an artist or like, and it was just amazing. Like they all had, they all had pieces of their son in different ways from all their organs. That's and really- so that's the thing, like, we, we don't know how we're connected. We don't know what the bigger picture is, mm-hmm. but we just got to be present in all of it and um, just be our true authentic self. Choose mm-hmm. our words carefully because our words are how we're presenting in the world, mm-hmm. you know, and yeah, well, this has been fascinating. What do you have for the listeners? And I'm going to ask that we all subscribe because I have fantastic, authentic conversations. Um, (laughs) What would you like to to say as final thoughts, final ideas to help people? Um, I think the one thing that I always like to just tell people, we touched on it a little bit, but to not be afraid of, what's coming up for you and the stories because they are just stories and they're not yours. And I think when you, you know, work with people like you or myself or whatever that, you know, we can provide that space to not only help you through what you're going through in that moment, but to be able to have tools to, to bring out into your life. So you can be very empowered and we are all here. It's all a journey, the journey back to knowing Mm -hmm. who really are, which is our divine self. And that we are, we are all connected. We are um, an expression of God itself. And um, we are meant to be living beautiful, joyful lives and being in service of others in whatever way that is for you, right? It, like you said, it doesn't have to be a job. You could be a parent. You could just be somebody walking around you know, shining your light and just going through the grocery store and people are feeling that. And that's, that's you, that's what you're here for. So the journey is to come back to discovering all of that, but, um, you know, you're meant to really, you're not meant to be here under fear and scarcity and suffering. Mm-hmm. You're meant to be, you know, you're meant to have a, a beautiful life because you are a beautiful divine person, soul. So it's, well, she couldn't have summed it up better. Anyways, <laughs> once again, it was a pleasure to have Amy on my show. Follow us, subscribe. And uh, this is Authentic Conversations presented by Transition Clarity. I'm your host, Adele Bernard. Have a good day. Thank you.